warm welcome to today's launch of our new IMF book entitled Unmasking Control, a Guide to Beneficial Ownership Transparency. Given this title of our seminar, the threshold question for some of you, both in this audience but also we have a very large virtual audience, that question might be, what is beneficial ownership? Well, let me start by answering that. The issue of beneficial ownership transparency is all about corporate structures and in particular understanding who the natural persons are, the actual human beings that ultimately own and control or control companies. The next question is why is it so important to be able to know who are the natural persons that control the company? Companies obviously play a key, a key role in our economies and they can be an enormous force for good, driving business and financial activity. They can be used to hold and move vast sums of money, including for foreign direct investment and other important financial flows. At the same time, however, these corporate structures, which are so important for our economies, can also be misused for criminal purposes. We have all heard the stories, the court cases, about data leaks, such as the Pandora Papers and the Panama and the Paradise Papers. They illustrate how corporate structures have been used to abuse and hide the identities of criminals and the proceeds of criminal activity. Corporate structures can be used for these illicit purposes because of the distance that the legal form of a company can create from the human beings, again, who are the actual actors behind these companies. Beneficial ownership transparency is therefore about going beyond that distance and linking the company more directly and transparently with the individuals who actually own or control that company. So again, this is all about beneficial ownership. Why in the world does the IMF care about these issues? Well, because a lack of beneficial ownership transparency can have a material macroeconomic impact on our member countries. And here there are many examples that we can think about. Anonymous shell companies have been used to funnel illicit money and buy real estate. We have seen the media stories of increased foreign real estate ownership in cities around the world, often purchased and held in the name of corporate structures. Some, of course, not by any means all, but some of these flows involve the use of dirty money to purchase assets for criminals, their families, and their associates, which can drive up real estate prices and create property bubbles. Another example, the proceeds of corruption and tax evasion are often funneled through companies. An IMF study in 2019 calculated that almost a trillion dollars in tax revenues is lost annually to corruption alone. I'll give you a further quick example. In public procurement, where government officials or the families can hide behind companies that will that, and be awarded huge procurement contracts that these individuals themselves may not have been eligible for. This can lead to higher public expenditure, lower quality public investment in countries and the resulting loss, loss of confidence of populations in their governments. Having transparent corporate structures helps the competent authorities to distinguish between legitimate companies and those that are fronts for money laundering, terrorist financing, or myriad other criminal activities. So this new book written by the IMF legal department, and kudos to the legal department team that, that contributed to writing this excellent book. Uh, this new book on this topic provides a comprehensive and practical guide. We hope it's going to be a comprehensive and a practical guide for public authorities and stakeholders to address these challenges. Of course, the IMF is not in this alone by any means. The IMF, oh, <laughs> I guess you weren't hearing me earlier. <laughs> the IMF is, of course, not in this alone. The Financial Action Task Force, which is the international AML-CFT standard setter, leads these efforts, including through requirements that countries have effective systems for timely access to adequate, accurate, and up-to-date information on the beneficial owners of companies. In addition, civil society and the press also have critical roles to play in shining a light on these structures and on their true owners who are the ones driving the action. So all of this brings us to our very impressive panel that we have today to explore further these challenges and these solutions. First, we have Bo Lee, our own IMF Deputy Managing Director, who is going to lead the discussion today. As DMD, Bo is responsible for the IMF's work in almost 90 of our member countries and on a wide range of policy issues, including our work on financial integrity. Prior to joining the fund in 2021, 
Bo was the deputy governor of the People's Bank of China, where he supported key reforms on anti-money laundering, among others. He's both an economist and a lawyer, and so he is best placed to put into context this book and the importance of beneficial ownership transparency to the IMF's mandate. I mentioned the critical role played by the Financial Action Task Force, and we have on the panel Raja Kumar, who is the president of the FATF. One of the priorities of the FATF presidency under Raja is to support members in implementing the revised standards on beneficial ownership. Given his current position and rich experience in law enforcement, regulations, and policies as senior advisor at Singapore's Ministry of Home Affairs, Raja is uniquely placed to enlighten us on the expected challenges for implementation and the opportunities for success. I also mentioned the vital role that civil society organizations play in this whole undertaking. And we also have on the panel Ruben Lufuka, who is the vice chair of Transparency International's board of directors. Anti-corruption efforts can be supported by beneficial ownership transparency, especially in cases where corrupt officials misuse companies to hide their ownership. Ruben will share with us potential synergies between country authorities and civil society organizations to achieve effective beneficial ownership systems. Again, a very warm welcome to all of you in the audience, virtual and physical, and to our fabulous panel. We know this is going to be a stimulating discussion. I'm going to leave it here and turn it over to Bo, who will be chairing this session. Thanks again, and welcome to all. Do I need to take that? Uh... No? OK. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to be here today um, to launch this new book, um, Unmasking Control, a guide to beneficial ownership transparency, which we hope will contribute to our members' efforts to combat the misuse of corporate structures. Before I start with our panelists, uh, let me make uh, briefly make a couple of uh, observations. The first observation is that um, the IMF has now recognized the lack of transparency of companies can have macroeconomic consequences. We know all too well stories of countries that failed because corrupt actors embezzled public funds and moved them abroad by hiding behind anonymous companies. These criminals are taking away basic services from the people in their country. We have also seen what happens when lack of beneficial ownership transparency results in a country getting low ratings against international standards. For example, when countries are publicly identified on the FATF gray list, they can face pressures on correspondent banking relationships, compromising their access to the international financial system. My second observation is that uh, our book, launched today, is aimed at helping our members to implement comprehensive framework to hold beneficial ownership information. Unmasking the identity of the real persons behind corporate structures will assist our members in preventing crime and promoting economic growth. With the recent revision of the FATF standards on AML CFT, this book will also support countries to meet these new requirements. There is no one-size-fits-all solution because country circumstances, capacities, and the vulnerabilities vary. For this reason, we adopt a practical approach by looking at the life cycle of a company and providing guiding questions so authorities can decide what best fits their needs. We'll also discuss the use of beneficial ownership information for other government priorities beyond AML CFT. My final observation is that uh, this book 
in the combination of research and dialogue with key stakeholders and IMF staff from the legal department. It was made possible by the generous support from the AML CFT Trust Fund donors, which include Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Korea, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. Today we will hear the views and perspectives of three different institutions, including FATF, Transparency International, and IMF. And we will focus on three topics. First, we will discuss the challenges countries face. Second, we will discuss the possible solutions. And finally, the third, we will discuss the way forward, including how we can best support our members. I'm very thankful to our panelists who have agreed to join us today for this discussion. So let's get started with uh, Raja. You know Raja is the president of FATF. Can you explain to us the role of uh, FATF, including the, with respect to beneficial ownership transparency? Why have countries struggled with implementing these requirements to date, please. Well, thank you both for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, wonderful to be here with all of you to discuss uh, what is uh, a very much uh, a major topic that is of contemporary interest today uh, as we are dealing with um, a very challenging landscape where criminals are making use of uh, corporate structures which are anonymous and uh, opaque structures to essentially hide, to mask their identities as well as their assets. And, you know, it is with that uh, as context that I will talk, first of all, uh, about what FATF does. I, I realize that not everyone here may be familiar with FATF. So, in brief, FATF is the global standard setter in this area of anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism, as well as proliferation financing. We have been described as a global watchdog for uh, money laundering and uh, terrorism financing as well as proliferation financing. Um, our mandate, um, as well as uh, the roles and uh, responsibilities and, and tasks that FedEx has been charged with, has evolved over the past years, uh, evolving in tandem with the global landscape. Um, but at the end of the day, the bottom line objective of all that we do remains the same, and it is to really prevent criminals, terrorists, the corrupt from abusing the international financial system. To this end, FATF on its part makes it a point to continually review our standards, uh, which are de facto the global standards, and these are the FATF's 40 plus 11 recommendations. As we have seen from, um, you know, from international typologies and uh, recent exposés, um, really FedEx has been warning uh, for, for some time now about how anonymous shell companies and other opaque structures are enabling organized crime groups, uh, terrorists, um, you know, the corrupt and money launderers, sanctions evaders to launder their dirty money. As we have, um, you know, first addressed the problem, in fact, when we established standards on transparency of beneficial ownership to prevent the abuse of uh, legal persons for money laundering and terrorism financing purposes as early as 2003. Unfortunately, our assessments that we do on a country basis show that quite a number of countries have still not implemented the full suite of FEDEF recommendations. That's one part of the problem. The second part of it is even if you have some laws in place or even most of the laws in place, the question is, are you taking effective action to implement, to operationalize the laws that you have? And sadly, you know, the verdict is that we are not doing enough at this point in time. 
Some countries have thought, you know, put in place some rules. But the reality is this is insufficient because criminals are savvy enough to navigate and find their way around uh, and exploit the gaps that they see within a national uh, infrastructure in terms of the suite of laws that you have. And they will exploit that space and uh, carry on laundering. It is not enough as well uh, for us to take a look at it from the national perspective. Because when you look at it globally, the international financial system is only as strong as its weakest link. And again, criminals will exploit the space between jurisdictions, jurisdictions that are doing what is necessary to maintain a high level of not just uh, you know, vigilance, they have the laws in place, they're enforcing the laws, but at the other end of the spectrum, there are those that are not doing their part. And this regulatory arbitrage is being optimized and fully exploited by criminals and money launderers alike. So the challenge ahead of us is how do we get the global system to up our game and essentially prevent criminals, money launderers, sanctions evaders from exploiting the international financial system for their illicit purposes, their nefarious ends. We need to essentially lift the veil, expose them as well as their assets, which then enables us to go after their assets yeah, and seize them to prevent further crime from occurring. So I'll start off with that. Thank you. Thank you, Raja, for your insightful introduction. Um, let me uh, now turn to Ruben uh, for better understanding from uh, your perspective as an international NGO. How effective do you think countries have been encountering the abuse of companies? Why does uh, transparency of beneficial ownership matter to civil society as much as it does to governments? Please. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. and. Um, we're happy to share a few thoughts uh, on this important subject matter. There is a, already a very strong uh, consensus that anonymous shell companies have enabled kleptocracy, they've enabled tax evasion, wildlife uh, uh, crimes, as well as uh, arms trafficking. Now, the corrupt and criminals have uh, hidden behind anonymous companies for a while without any trace. And the Pandora's uh, Papers, uh, the investigations do illustrate this uh, pretty well. Yet again, what the Pandora Papers uh, illustrates is that elected officials, military leaders, as well as business persons, continue to use shell companies and other legal vehicles uh, in secret uh, jurisdictions for the purpose of moving wealth offshore. And what the Pandora Papers equally uh, revealed is that at least 35 heads of state and about 300 politicians in 90 countries allegedly evaded scrutiny and shielded themselves with anonymity. And from this number, nearly 50 politicians and about five current and former heads of state were from Africa. Some of them who previously presented themselves as strong anti-corruption reformers. What is worrying is a volume of capital flight, which is in stark contrast with the abject poverty, as well as the underdevelopment in most African countries. But prior to the Pandora's Papers, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers and all the other leaks, they did shed light on this uh, particular issue. And what we've, of course, seen is that while owning assets through anonymous structures offshore may not necessarily be illegal, however, the concern that we have as Transparency International is that the revelations do show the extent to which elected officials as well as private individuals advance private interest uh, through suspicious uh, deals. And the times they do this without any regard to asset and uh, conflict of interest rules. They engage in corrupt deals willingly. Now, how can this be possible, considering the fact that there's been a lot of awareness 
created around this issue in the last couple of years. There have been a number of commitments made by governments. Mr. Kumar did rightly point out, and we share that concern, that a great majority of the countries have ineffective beneficial ownership transparency systems. And that is an issue that we need to be addressing. A key concern for us as Transparency International has to do with information. Just when we start off, we, we're looking at the issue of information, which according to the global standard should be available, it should be accurate, it should be complete, and it should be up to date. Now, in March 2022, uh, the Financial Action uh, Task Force did embark on the re revisions, and I think Mr. Kumar referred to this. We consider this to be an important decision to revise the global standard. Now, this global standard on company ownership potentially could change the picture significantly. And I'm proud to say that as Transparency International, we played a significant role in this uh, process of reform. We campaigned for a number of years for tougher global rules uh, in order to end the abuse of anonymous companies. And Transparency International has been calling for the revision of the standard going way back to 2019, when we concluded that the standard at the time did go far too much in providing flexibility. But it was also insufficient insofar as providing guidance to uh, countries on how they can go about identifying who owns which uh, anonymous corporate structures. And specifically, we called for public central registers as a key measure to be implemented. Now, while we have acknowledged the important strides that have been taken as Transparency International, we continue to call on governments to open up the registers to additional stakeholders who would include civil society and uh, the, the media. And we have various examples where we can demonstrate how public registers allow both civil society and competent authorities to identify, but also to counter uh, cross-border financial crimes. This, we believe, should be the norm worldwide, having access to open public registers. I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ruben, for raising a very important point about opening the information to civil society and then and, and to public. Uh, now let me offer some uh, perspective from IMF. Uh, we have also observed similar challenges from our members. Let me give an example. During the pandemic, the IMF provided emergency financing to countries. It was important for us to ensure there was transparency and accountability in spending. So our mantra is spend what you need, but keep the receipts. Mm -hmm. An important way to do this was for countries to commit to publishing beneficial ownership information of companies awarded procurement contracts. Implementation of these measures have now become a standard feature in our subsequent and longer term fund supported programs and are included as conditionality for disbursement of financing from IMF. I want to highlight two common challenges that we have seen in the last couple of years. First, we have noticed the concept of beneficial ownership is not always clear to authorities. While some had a better grasp, other agencies such as procurement or company registries did not. Some officials thought only the majority shareholder can be a beneficial owner, even if the majority shareholder is another company. But we know a beneficial owner can never be another company. And the control can be exercised in different ways. Who hasn't heard of the cases where companies are owned on paper by straw persons, like family members of the real owner. It is important 
to look beyond the legal smoke screen to have a comprehensive understanding of who can be a beneficial owner. The second challenge was with verification of this information. It is not sufficient for information to be simply provided. This information needs to be verified to be accurate, adequate, and up to date. This means countries must have knowledge to pierce through complicated corporate structure, sometimes including companies from other countries. Being able to respond to such challenges will be critical to assist our member countries. With that, let me now to invite uh, Raja to set out for us the main improvements that were adopted to the FATF standard in March 2022, which is a major step forward from our perspective. And what do you think will be the most challenging aspects of the new standard for countries to implement? Please. Well, thank you, um, Bobo, for, for that question. Um, it's a great uh, segue into what uh, was mentioned earlier uh, in terms of what FedEx has done. So in 2020, FedEx actually started uh, a very comprehensive uh, review of its uh, rules relating to beneficial ownership, uh, essentially updating and strengthening the transparency requirements for companies and other legal persons. And this falls under recommendation 24 for those who are FedEx geeks and who understand uh, the detailed recommendations. And after undertaking what was a very thorough two-year review, including multiple public consultations, uh, these uh, revisions were actually adopted by the FedEx plenary in March this year. So what are the changes to recommendation 24, the rule change? is that countries really need to take a multi-pronged approach uh, to essentially um, you know, ensure uh, adequate, uh, accurate, and up-to-date information on beneficial ownership. This means that countries will need to take uh, not just a single modality, but a number of complementary measures including the need for a country to have a beneficial ownership registry in place, or in the alternative, an equivalent mechanism. The aim is, uh, again, to enable authorities to have rapid as well as efficient access to adequate, accurate, and up-to-date information on who the true owners of a company are, uh, which are operating in their country. And the first step that authorities uh, in, in any jurisdiction that they need to undertake is to identify, assess, and then mitigate the money laundering and terrorism financing risks that are associated with companies. The recent revision significantly also includes the need for countries to explicitly take into account the risks that are posed by foreign companies that are operating in your jurisdiction. On the part of companies, the challenge is now for them to hold updated information that shows the identity of the beneficial owners of, of their company. Um, and this is really crucial if you think about it for investigators who need, you know, when they come knocking on the door to get very, um, you know, I would say accurate updated information that would then enable their investigations to flow smoothly. Even if hidden behind a chain of holding companies or nominees. In addition, another major uh, step forward has been that FedEx has actually uh, banned the use of bearer shares. And for existing bearer shares, the disclosure requirements have been enhanced, including nominee arrangements. These measures will, again, further stop the use of fronts or paid measures being used to hide money laundering and other criminal activities. I would say that overall, these rules really represent a major step forward in this uh, you know, effort to increase the uh, transparency 
of uh, corporate information and uh, to have this made available to the authorities. Um, and it allows, uh, in the area of corruption, for example, it allows procurement uh, decisions uh, for the people who are reviewing this to actually discover who the true owners of the bidders are. And I think this is really uh, an important uh, aspect. Overall, it is going to enhance governance. It will help trace the identities as well as the assets of both criminals and terrorists and prevent tax evasion. I, uh, you know, referring to the question, I think uh, for some countries, they are going to struggle to operationalize and implement uh, these new standards. And that is where, uh, you know, FATF has recognized that we will need to help our members as well as the global network uh, um, get a deeper, better understanding of this. And that is why we have actually developed guidance to help countries on their way. Yeah? And I really welcome in this regard the work that's been done by IMF, uh, the unmasking control is a wonderful, uh, you know, additional um, toolkit that would help countries uh, better find their way forward on, on what is a very challenging area. Um, the other thing is, and this is a peek into the future, is we've taken a look at regula uh, Recommendation 24, and now we are looking into legal arrangements, including trusts, and having greater transparency on, on that area. Uh, this, uh, there's going to be a proposal that is coming up to the FATF plenary just next week. So after this, I head to, to Paris uh, to chair my first plenary. And this is one of the issues that uh, we're going to have to, to deal with. Um, so overall, I think um, there has been really, uh, you know, I would say good progress. But we are under no illusions at all that uh, the challenges are, st are, are still uh, plenty and significant, and what is really important is not just getting countries to put in place the rules, but very importantly, to then operationalize the rules, take action, show that they're very serious about driving this forward. Thank you, thank you, Raja. Uh, we look forward to uh, reading your upcoming uh, guidance uh, on the new standards. Mm -hmm. Now let me turn to Ruben again. Um, from your perspective, do you think the revised standards have changed enough to have a material impact? And what support would countries require going forward? Please. Thank you. I, I think let's start on, uh, on a positive note. The revised standards are very important uh, because as far as we're concerned, they establish a baseline and they ensure that uh, countries around the globe all um, work adequately to respond to the serious threats that uh, anonymous companies uh, do present. And in particular, as uh, um, Mr. Kumar mentioned, this adoption of a multi-pronged approach to beneficial ownership is something that we welcome with the requirements to have registers in place. This should ideally level the playing field. And so are the other measures that have been proposed, um, including the prohibition of bearer shares, uh, the better regulation and transparency of nominee, uh, shareholders and directors, the availability of uh, beneficial ownership uh, information to public uh, procurement authorities. We consider this to be very important, but as well as the need for countries to better understand the risks posed by both foreign and uh, um, domestic uh, companies. That is well and good. However, it, it, it is regrettable that uh, it was impossible to achieve consensus on the need uh, for uh, access uh, to public, I mean, the public access to information. Uh, we still think that this is important, but also on the need for uh, a unique centralized uh, register. Would have wanted to have uh, that conversation around that. But in other areas, while important advances have been made, the final text leaves substantial room for interpretation. And that in itself presents its own challenges. For example, the standard requires a register alternative mechanism to serve or to fulfill the same objective. Now, there are certainly going to be challenges on how alternative mechanisms will be interpreted and will be enforced by the FATF members. We also worry about the impact that this may have on the availability of beneficial ownership information. So we still see that as uh, a challenge that needs to be addressed. 
But the revised recommendation 24 also requires beneficial ownership information to be verified, as it has already been stated. However, the standard does not indicate and assign this responsibility to a government authority in order to ensure that there is accuracy. So how is this going to be verified? That, that is still hanging in the air. It is nevertheless uh, positive that this, the new standards set the ground for more advanced discussions on what is a good register. We can now have that conversation. But it also helps us to identify specific issues that should be taken into consideration by countries that would like to have a strong, effective, beneficial ownership transparency system. So we are glad to see the, com the discussions advancing on many fronts. We're glad that the IMF are launching this guide. We're looking forward to the guidance to be provided by FATF on um, how countries can go on to implement the recommendations. But we're also happy that several countries that have been resisting this whole transparency reform are now starting the conversations. That in itself is a major step forward. And we do hope that these conversations can go on and we can continue to improve on the transparency insofar as uh, beneficial ownership uh, transparency is concerned. But going forward, international organizations should continue to monitor the implementation of the standard and providing further guidance based on lessons learned and the impact stories uh, that uh, they'll gather from the implementation of the new recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, very important uh, to start the conversation. I think the, the new recommendation 24 is like a, a new stage for that, for that constructive conversation mm -hmm. and dialogue, and also, of course, uh, continued work. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, offer our perspective from this uh, new book that we are launching today. Um, this book has been developed to help our members to overcome the many implementation challenges explained by Raja and Ruben. The book is based on our experience in engaging with our members on this issue and suggests best practices regarding key policy decisions countries must make when putting in place a framework to make ownership and the control of companies more transparent. The book is structured around four central challenges countries commonly face when developing effective frameworks. The first challenge is related to establishing a strong understanding of the corporate landscape in the country and the risk of misuse of these entities. The second challenge relates to various practical decisions countries need to make when deciding on their beneficial ownership system and sources of information that will be used. The third challenge relates to ensuring that laws are implemented and to ensure consistent use of the information across the government. The, fa the final challenge the book considers is potential policy and regulatory impacts when implementing a new system. For example, how much is it going to cost? Who should be involved? To support policymakers and technical assistance providers, this book includes a series of practical guiding questions in each section designed to facilitate strategic thinking among relevant stakeholders so that the framework is tailored to country-specific circumstances. Now let me turn to the final question. What is the way forward? This time let me start with Ruben. How do you think international organizations, including the IMF, can better work with civil society organizations, including to leverage their support to help our member countries? Please. 
I'd like to start by uh, saying that uh, we appreciate the good work that the IMF and uh, the FFT uh, have been doing the last few years. And as Transparency International, we very much welcome the shift that we've seen um, in the last few years with a willingness to listen to uh, civil society, but also meaningfully engage um, with our proposals. Civil society does have expertise. And crucially, we also have the independence uh, to make us trustworthy partners. And I want to believe that as Transparency International, our track record in working around beneficial ownership transparency does demonstrate that. But in advancing this cause further, civil society can play many roles, from acting as watchdogs to scrutinizing data, uh, supporting the assessment of risks, but also providing uh, policy recommendations. And Transparency International, with more than 100 national chapters, is determined to support and monitor the implementation of a new standard. And our national chapters have critical information and knowledge on the ground and can provide key insights when it comes to FATIS mutual evaluations, for instance. And we've done that in the past. Whenever it's been possible, we've taken uh, advantage of the opportunity to engage in the mutual evaluations. And we hope that there will still be further opportunities to do that. We also have very good examples as Transparency International through our chapters in making contribution to the IMF's uh, Article 14 surveillance reports on matters related to beneficial ownership uh, transparency, but more broadly on anti-corruption work. But, and we've also been supporting meaningfully the implementation of the 2018 framework on, uh, uh, for enhanced uh, engagement on governance. And in our view, international organizations should build on the successes and guarantee the civil society engagement in a more systematic manner in the assessment and decision making. Taking advantage of the vast expertise that exists not just in the TI movement, but beyond. Thank you, thank you, Ruben. Um, Raja, in your view, how can FATF and IMF complement each other uh, to support countries in the implementation of the new standards? Please. Well, um, I acknowledge that, that uh, you know, I, the IMF has really been a, a major uh, strategic partner uh, for FATF in terms of uh, this whole area of capacity building, for example. Uh, when I take a look at um, the work that IMF has done to support FATF, this includes undertaking mutual evaluations, providing technical assistance, um, and giving guidance as well. Um, the recent, you know, your, your latest publication is a great example of that. Uh, so overall, I would say highly beneficial, highly valuable, uh, which is needed because as we uh, move now, from the fourth round of mutual evaluations to the fifth round. There's going to be uh, a fresh set. Uh, in fact, the bars can be raised uh, with the fifth round of mutual evaluations. Countries will be held to a higher standard uh, with the revised rules that we put in place. And all a for sure right, why we need uh, the help of uh, you know, very strong strategic partners like the IMF uh, to work with us uh, to ensure that especially the lower capacity countries need a lot of technical assistance, uh, even resource support, and so on. And uh, this would really uh, enable them uh, to be that much more effective in terms of putting in place the laws as well as operationalizing the laws. And I think, uh, as we discussed earlier, one of the important things is helping countries not just put in place the laws, but the next step is how, what do I then do once I have the laws in place? What's uh, you know, the best way to actually uh, get these laws uh, put into practice, what are the best practices maybe that exist in this space that we can learn from other countries. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel, but basically work of, uh, you know, establish uh, good practice that's already out there. Yeah. And again, you know, with Transparency International, you've been very useful in terms of giving us real feedback yeah, so that uh, we can then take into account uh, uh, such feedback to, to sharpen uh, the standards and uh, the guidance as well that is then provided to countries. So this has to be a collaborative effort. No single entity can do this alone. 
uh, but when we have uh, strong partners working together, working collaboratively, uh, and converging with the same overarching objective in mind, I think we can move the needle and we can secure far better results. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raja. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, certainly, from IMF uh, perspective, uh, we uh, very much value our working relationship and we, you know, we will continue uh, to strengthen our cooperation going forward. Uh, let me also briefly uh, mention that beneficial ownership information can also have many uses beyond financial integrity. This includes public procurement, countering tax evasion or avoidance, financial supervision, and prevent public officials from hiding any illicit wealth. In our new book, we explore these um, multifaceted uses. We will be able to assist with these issues through our technical assistance as well. Finally, let me now turn over to Raja and Ruben to offer some concluding remarks. What would be your one key takeaway from our, our discussion today? Please, uh, Raja. Um, for me, it is really driving effectiveness across the global network. Um, if countries are not effective, then we are allowing criminals, um, tax evaders, sanctions evaders, to continue to move their money with impunity, taking full advantage of loopholes. And um, again, this would be a travesty. Uh, what is really required is uh, a tightening up of uh, the, the regime, um, giving very clear guidance to countries on what the expectations are, what they need to do, and then to monitor, yeah, track implementation to successful operationalization. Now, that is going to be crucial. And really, for us to make a difference, we need to build transparency collectively at a global level, and it has to start now. Ruben. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be part of uh, the, the panel discussion and for the excellent discussion. Um, I'm extremely encouraged by where we are today um, insofar as beneficial ownership transparency is concerned. We're definitely uh, at a different place than we were about a year ago. And one takeaway is really that the revised uh, standard can help countries um, counter corruption and show up funds which they desperately need for, uh, for development. But this can only be realized if the new standard is effectively implemented. So the IMF's uh, new guidance comes at an opportune time, and we hope that many countries will be able to use this. But domestic and foreign competent authorities, civil society, and investigative uh, journalists around the world can exponentially do a lot more work if more information or more data is available and available in a timely manner. And we hope that in a year's time we'll be discussing how the progress that we've made insofar as uh, making this happen. But finally, just to indicate to uh, Rajan that we are happy that there's discussion now on recommendation 25. And we do hope that uh, you can cover the remaining loopholes insofar as uh, improving transparency and mitigating risks that are associated with trust. And we hope that the, the membership will give this the due consideration that it needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that's a very good uh, point to conclude. Uh, I think the key message, my takeaway is that we're making good progress, but there is much more to be done. So that's a, that's a key message. So I want to thank my panelists uh, for taking time today to join us. I also want to thank everyone who are uh, uh, gathering here and also who, are, uh, who have uh, uh, turned in uh, to listen. I hope this has been an insightful and uh, useful discussion. Uh, addressing the challenges of corporate mi uh, misuse requires uh, efforts from all of us. We stand ready. We want to work, continue to work with the FATF, continue to work with uh, civil society to support our members in these endeavors. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the annual meetings here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.